I'm so excited to have Paul Jackson Jr. here today. What attracted you to the Overture pedal? Well, as you may or may not know, I'm an old guy, not an old guy. I've been doing this for a number of years, you know, played on fortunately a lot of records. I, I tell people I had the distinction of playing on the number one record in the world 35 years apart. First, Michael Jackson's Thriller, and then uh, Daft Punk's Random Access Memory. So that was kind of, that's kind of a cool statement, and then a lot of stuff in between. But um, one of the things I've noticed is a big push, because I also teach it at the University of Southern California, and one of the things I noticed among the students and players is a big push back to pedals. Everybody still loves pedals, you know, what's the latest and greatest, whatever. And uh, what I tell the students is, pedals are wonderful, but you have to make the push toward automation. Uh, a lot of shows have been able to do, be it American Idol or the Oscars or the Kennedy Center Honors, you may have two beats to switch from a clean rhythm sound to an overdrive sound with delays and reverb and everything else. Well, back in the day, if you, you know, had to do that, you had to hit three or four buttons, you know, so it'd take you probably a bar. Okay, now if you have two beats, you know, with some of the automated pedal boards, some of the cool switchers that are out, you can do it in one bar with one switch, but you can't switch the actual settings on a pedal unless the pedal is MIDI and MIDI usually means digital. So the thing that I like about the Overture is it's totally MIDI programmable, but it's all analog. So you still get all the cool, warm sound of you know your favorite analog drive, but in a situation where it's programmable, predictable, and you can go between pre presets really, really fast. And so for me, that's like, you know, right up my alley. Paul, what's your favorite, what do you call it, mode or sound yeah. on the pedal? Well, well, like I said, I, 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 I kind of like all of them. I do like all of them. The, the interesting thing is like, okay, and, um, and I talked about a little bit in the video is that usually when people are demoing drive types of sounds, they start with, you know, a Marshall amp or a Vox AC30 or, you know, some type of amp that, you know, is, has a propensity towards great sounding drive. Most people do not have Marshalls. Most people have Fender Hot Rod Deluxes or something of that ilk where, you know, it's like it's going to be a clean amp. So, so one of the things I wanted to do was start, see how this worked with a bone clean sound. So I'm using my Fuchs, but clean sound. Ah, wait a minute. Can't play today. Okay, so I wanted to start with a bone stock clean sound and just kind of scroll through the sound. So, okay, right now, pedals bypass. So let's go to, let's okay, preset one, I had classic. So, and I didn't use much drive on that. I used it to double a bass line, so. Still does pinch harmonics very well, but the gain right now is not very high on this setting. I could turn the gain up. Turn the volume down in the you know, and you can get you know a really great amount of gain even without the pre-boost on, and that's just that one sound. But let's pull it back some. Let's pull the gain back. And So, barely, barely buzzing, you know, for a front pickup. You know, so really smooth, really, you know, classic overdrive sound. Okay, so that's just one preset. You know, and you can obviously do all the parameters as you saw me twisting knobs. I'm a knob twister. Oh, that's the other thing is in the middle of a set, if you have presets, you don't have to twist knobs. You know, let's say even if you don't have a MIDI rack, and I'm sure that MIDI rig or, you know, and I'm sure you'll talk about this, but with the pedal, as it sits, you have four presets. So, and you just grab both switches. Excuse me. Uh, that's in the camera here. Yep, no, stay here. Okay, and you just hit both switches. 
in the switches modes. So the cool thing is you don't have to be the knob twister in the set. You just hit, you know, hit the two pedals and you can have a totally different overdrive. But, you know, classic sound. Okay, let's turn it back on here. Okay. So, like I said, I use this to double a bass line. But let's say you want something really, you know, big. Let's go to, oh, and to save a preset, simple, simple, easy. Button in the center, just butter, excuse me, button in the center. Just hold the button in the center for a couple of seconds. You see it flash? Done. Programmed. Okay, so let's go to another sound. Let's go to, uh, let's go to the crunch. Okay, once again, we're dealing with a bone clean amplifier. Still don't have the pre the uh, pre gain in, which is cool. The pre boost, and then let's say you just want clean boost. Let's try the clean boost. All right, let's see here. Now, usually, now you usually in my set, I have uh, or when I'm doing things, I have a setting called clean solo. Clean solo is usually just a little louder than clean rhythm just for exactly that clean solo. So you have clean boost, which you can, you know, you can have treble if you want more treble. You know, just to cut through a little bit better. You know, more bass or maybe just more gain. You know, so it's just really cool. And then, you know, if you want to drive your amplifier, if you have an amp that you want to just drive harder into distortion or overdrive, you can do that too with a clean boost, which is cool. And like I said, right now I have the gain pretty low. You know, but, you know, so I like that a lot too. So let's see what else we get. Oh, for the solo stuff on the video, I did this. I went to smooth and I turned the pre boost on. Phone rang for the solo. <laughs> that happens to all of us. Yeah, I uh, let me turn the finger off here. Okay, there we go. So for the solo stuff, I said, okay, let me just experiment. And like I said, guys, I, you know, for the people watching this video, I got this pedal like a couple of days ago. So bear with me. So I said, okay, great. Let's go to smooth and let's put in some pre boost so we get the gain pretty high. And you know, you got. So really, really, really versatile, which is cool. And and um, and like I said, I'm just kind of touching the surface and I've only had it for a couple of days, but it's very easy to get around, very intuitive. And like I said, it's all analog, so it sounds great. Very cool. Yay. So how, um, you know, on your typical board, like how many uh, how many overdrives would you normally have on a, on a board with, you know, your standard, uh, you know, non-programmable overdrives? Nowadays, I see at least three. You know, they want like a big, you know, a big crunchy sound, like a more like almost, you know, distortion. Then the guys will have a clean boost. Then guys will have like an overdrive, like a, you know, a, you know, a screamer type overdrive, you know, or some of that ilk or of that, you know, vibe, you know, or they'll have two to get like, you know, some, you know, classic sounds of a couple folks that, you know, will go nameless, but um, that usually at least three, you know, clean boost. A distortion and then some kind of overdrive so it's you know, save a lot of money and space on boards for a lot of people well you brought up a very valid point because real estate on boards that's the other thing and a lot of guys want boards i've seen boards that are like this big that guys can like just put in their and literally in their backpack 
or like in a small case in the overhead and just go play. So, you know, you get something like this, um, you know, let's say a Roland MS, what's that thing called, an MS3 that's got a MIDI output and a few loops you're, and it's got delay and things like that and a pedal and you're good to go. Yeah. You've got everything you need, you know? Cool. So, um, and you've got, once again, I can't stress it enough, is you're dealing with analog, not digital. Yeah, totally 100% analog on this yeah. thing. That was the trick to get so many circuits in one little, you know, box. Right. <laughs> Took him a whole year. Thank good. Thank goodness for COVID, right? Yeah, it was just my little. And I, but, but how I spent my quarantine was was. Well, you done good. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's it's really happy. You know, I mean, it was a little scary. You know, as being our first, you know, pedal. It's always been, you know, basically we've been trying to make things that don't sound like anything. You know, switchers that are just transparent. Right. Oh, so, you know, to to do something that actually has a a tone and a, you know, a signature to it that, you know, is a kind of a daunting task, but at least I was kind of forced to spend an awful lot of time on it. And it, it, it was, it, it um, you know, it was, it was, I like, I'm happy with how it came out. Sure. And you brought up a very valid point that I didn't think about no pops and clicks. So you, you know, dead quiet on the switches. I didn't have it in solo mode. Forgive me. Yeah. Okay. A lot of game here, but I'll pull the game down. Wonderful. Now, no pop, <laughs> no clicks, which is great. And so that that's and that's critical too. So, you know, via MIDI or, or hitting the switches on and off, they're dead quiet. Now, something I didn't think about is a lot of times when you're, you know, doing shows or doing a recording, you have to do what's called normalize the, the level. So, you know, if I'm playing a rhythm part, you know, I'm, I don't know, I don't know, playing the rhythm part. And they say, okay, switch to a solo sound. And to get enough volume, you turn the gain way up and stuff like that. But with this, you can turn the gain up, but turn the output volume down. And then let's say, okay, I have a sound that has a clean boost. Okay, well, you turn the boost up, but maybe you can turn the volume up a little higher on this one because on the overdrive sound, it would be overwhelming. But on this, you know, you can kind of, so you can kind of level out, you can kind of normalize all of the levels to be tolerable to the engineer you know, with one pedal and it's programmable. So that's that's really, really handy. You know, when you're going, okay, can you get all of your sounds? Okay, I'm using this sound, using this sound, using this sound. Let me fix all the levels and normalize all the levels. So when I'm going from patch to patch to patch or sound to sound to sound, the levels don't jump all the way like that. They just kind of stay, you know, within a tolerable level, which is, um, which is really, really handy. So when you go do, I mean, I know you do a lot of sessions, when you go to a session, and I don't know how COVID has changed this, I imagine you go to a big studio and you're bringing a lot of your own gear. How many pedals are you bringing or what are you bringing? Well, I'm kind of a gear junkie. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> I, you know, I, I bring tons and tons of pedals. You know, I mean, you can kind of see it in the background is my Bradshaw rig here. It's got a gazillion pedals in it. But the thing about it is, um, I've been doing this for a long time and I, and I don't throw anything away. I just kind of recycle it and put it on another board. But for a person that's starting out, let's like say my students, for instance, as they are building their collection of things that they want to do, it's like, okay, or pedals that they need, you know, nobody has an infinite amount of money, you know, well, some people do, but, most <laughs> people do. but you don't have an infinite amount of board space. You don't have an infinite amount of board space either. So it's like, okay, I need something that sounds great first and foremost, uh, and is going to enhance what I'm trying to do. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's got a variety of sounds, uh, doesn't take up as much space as three pedals would, and it's programmable. You know, the choices start to get smaller and smaller and smaller, i.e., like, let's say, um, some of the Strymon delays, you know, and those pedals are big, but they're programmable and they have lots of, lots of variation on them. So you say, okay, well, I can get, you know, one delay that does a lot of things as opposed to this one because it's analog and this one because it's 
does ping pong and this one because it does modulated delay and this one because you know i can get one great sounding pedal the same thing here and like i said there are not a lot of choices at all where it's like okay i have different flavors of overdrive and a clean boost and a solo section and a pre-boost to gain so i can have like a sound for instance okay let's say i just have eh, let's see all right okay not a lot of drive but I say, I love that sound. I just want it a little hotter. So, kicking some previews. Okay. Oops. No fall camera. But we're just still we're just dealing with one pedal. So, a lot of versatility there. And so, when a person says, okay, it's got a lot of versatility, it's analog, it sounds great, it's got different options, and it's programmable. And you know the choice becomes you know clearer and clearer. Cool, very yeah. cool. So I have a personal question for you. Yes. How many albums have you played on that won Grammys? Oh wow. <laughs> I was reading your list. I saw it on Wikipedia. I started reading the list of all the names of albums you played on, and I mm -hmm. I don't know how many minutes it took me to get through the list, and I I have this feeling that there's some missing as well and so i just i thought i wonder how many he's they have won grammys that he's played on do you even have an idea i don't really know <laughs> unfortunately i i i have to look that up one day i do not really know it's gotta be dozens right? i mean the ones that are obvious are like i said the daft punk random access memory and michael jackson's thriller and the bodyguard soundtrack and uh chicago 17 and oh uh, shoot celine dion i mean there celine were dion. yeah i you know i I don't know this. I really don't know. <laughs> well, we should find, you know what? Somebody should uh, watch this and look it up and, and I need to find out. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I'll figure it out for you. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, one thing I was uh, curious about, you had mentioned you had, you teach at, uh, at uh, USC. Oh, did you say? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, what do you, um, what do you teach there exactly? Like what are your, what are the classes you teach? Well, I teach in the sophomore and junior pop classes where we train the kids to play together and like, well, let's start with freshmen. Freshmen, we teach the kids uh, 60s and early 70s rock and roll and R&B to give them a skill set, get them used to playing to each other, get them used to performing because it's a pop performance major. Second year, in the sophomore year, we do the same thing, but we add the addition of songs that are on the radio and songs from the 80s and 90s and 2000s as well. The third year is where it gets interesting because we take the kids in the studio and based on the skill sets that they've learned in years one and two, they have to write, arrange, produce, and play on their own compositions and each other's. Wow. So this weekend we were in the studio, actually this weekend, we're actually in the Village Recorders in, in West LA, and the students were recording uh, and producing their songs and playing as studio musicians on their compositions and each other's as well. So it's really fun. And then I, I also teach uh, individual guitar instruction. Oh, That's really? Cool. Do you play yeah. it over Zoom? Or how do you? Uh, Zoom, right now I'm Zooming, yes. Wow. Well, that's cool. So what else do you do? I mean, I know you're a producer, a, a composer, a musician. Is there anything else that teacher? <laughs> Is there something else we don't know about you? Well, let's see. Uh, the past uh, year before actually COVID hit, I was touring a lot with Jeff Lorber and Everett Harp. We have a group called Jazz Funk Soul and do a lot of festivals. And so that's been fun. Uh, and now I'm working on my next solo record. My last solo record came out in uh, 2017, Stories from Stomp and Willie. So this one is going to be called More Stories. And so I'm going to be releasing that in uh, the next couple of months. So excited about that. Very cool. Besides music, do you have any other hobbies or anything else big that you do? Uh, I like old cars and dog training and uh, teaching Bible study. And so oh, those are, that's what I do, yeah. So uh, uh, do you know Jay Leno? Because I know he's got a lot of uh, cars and uh, I think you were on Jay Leno. Yeah, I was on Jay Leno actually for three and a half years. In fact, I just um, I just emailed him yesterday because I saw a car on Hemmings. Hemmings is like the, the classified ads for like vintage cars. And it was a 1956 uh, Fairlane. And I asked him, did he have one? And he said he didn't have one, but his painter does. A beautiful car. And so, yeah, I just actually just emailed him a couple of days ago. So, yeah, we still, you know, we still stay in contact. And I, I hit him up about stuff and ask him questions. And I've been on uh, his show a couple of times, the uh, 
uh, the uh, what's it called? Jay Leno's garage. Been, yeah, been on Jay Leno's garage a couple of times. Once with my car, and then once uh, doing a game show kind of thing. So, uh, yeah. So we stay in pretty good contact. That's cool. 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 Yeah. So, uh, so let's talk. You you did this this cool uh, this cool track for us to uh, to demo the pedal. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit what you what you used? You know, the the equipment you used on that. Um, just so people know, you know, have a reference. Um, you know. Sure. Well, I use pretty much what I have here. This is my uh, PRS, what they call a 250, uh, pretty old guitar. And I wanted to use one guitar because there are a lot of great demos on YouTube and stuff. But a lot of times guys switch guitars, which is great. But most people don't have a bunch of guitars. Most people have one or two. So I said, let's do the demo with one guitar. Then, as I talked about, I wanted to do it with a really clean, a really clean sound, because you know, clean means a lot to a lot of different people. Because I, you know, I do a lot of rhythm stuff. Clean means to me no distortion. So that's clean to me. So no, no crunch, no nothing. And I wanted a really clean sound because I wanted people to understand that all of the drive from the uh, video, from, you know, the examples are all being generated just by the pedal. No compression, no nothing. Just basically straight into the guitar, into the pedal, into the amp, microphone in front of the amp. And that was a, a Fuchs amp, you said? Fuchs, yeah, Fuchs uh, Triple Overdrive Supreme. Oh, we love Andy. Over there in the back there. You can kind of see it over my shoulder. Yeah. Shout um, out to Andy Fuchs, yeah. Oh, yeah, we love Andy. So, you know, one thing we forgot to, to talk about, 18 volts, that this is, you know. Yeah. 18 volts. All right, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, a little uh, detail. But it, it, it um, somewhere along the line, I decided that was going to be the way it was going to be. It's going to take the, the incoming voltage and uh, boost it to 18. And it, it um, well, it made some aspects of actually designing it easier, actually, and then just Turns out that it actually just, you know, benefited the sound in general because it, you know, more headroom and just more kind of kind of a little more of everything in there when you when you do that. Yeah. And that's really cool because, you know, once again, getting back to pedal board building, you know, people buy the, you know, the power supplies, the, you know, the ones that are rectangular, you know, and they have tons and tons and tons of nine volt outputs because that's pretty much the standard. They might have a 12 volt here and there. They might have a reverse uh, polarity, nine volt for special pedals. And they, they may have one 18 volt or you have to gang two nine volts together. This is really cool because you can get a power supply from any, just about any manufacturer. Or if you want to use a wall wart, like I'm using here, you, you know, use a wall wart and you can find those anywhere. So I thought that was really, really, really clever. Yeah, it just uh, it just seemed to make sense, you know. Everyone's you know for for decades now, people are pretty much you know standardized on the nine volt thing. So yeah. uh, you know, might as well uh, keep with the keep with the program, but then just you know do the do the stuff inside to to get the more voltage. You know, one more thing that you might not know, he's coming out with an editor for the pedal too. Really. Um, Mac, or what are you planning on doing? It's yeah, it, that's still a ways away, but probably maybe the summer or so. But I figured. It'd be cool to, um, you know, just have like a, you know, basic editor librarian thing, you know, where you can like, you know, swap patches and that kind of thing and should be, um, yeah, probably um, PC, Mac, you know, iPhone, iPad kind of stuff. And so yeah, it's yeah. kind of cool too, I think, to, uh, you know, have that option available to people and you can, you know, back stuff back it up. up and yeah. That kind of yeah. Thing. And, and for people that are, you know, that are, you know, online, like you said, swapping sounds or doing sound libraries, you know, it's a great idea. You know, guys can swap sounds, they can do libraries, they can do all kinds of things, you know, although the pedal, you know, it's got, you know, basically five knobs and it's pretty straight ahead, you know, treble, treble bass, gain, volume, and, and then obviously the, the level of pre-boost. So it's, it's very intuitive, but even in that, like you said, guys may want to program, they may want to back up their pedal, they may want to, uh, you know, swap sounds with their buddies. So I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Is there anything else about the pedal that we haven't really covered that maybe Paul doesn't know about or that, uh, I mean, the editor, anything else? Well, um, there is, there, yeah, there is one thing that, um, well, yeah, basically, there is one thing that, uh, that that we haven't really explained really well yet to anybody. We're including, about to do a video including, about it. Including yourself. And so okay. He came in cold on this and, and did all this stuff for it. But basically, the way we handle the uh, the solo feature is different than what most pedals would have. You know, for most most uh, pedals, 
you know, if they have a boost button, it's just more, right? You right. just get, you get more. Um, but what I decided is I could have done that. And, you know, that would have been the perhaps the obvious choice. But but I figured since it's so programmable and all that, what, what the solo button actually does is it actually accesses different presets. So if you're actually, and so you can, so you can choose, um, so you can choose what the, the, the solo button actually does. And so the, um, and so basically, you know, when you hit your, if you're on like preset one and then you, uh, and then you hit the solo button, you'll, you'll notice that the, the, the lights turn green instead of red. And um, all of a sudden you're, you're not, you're not on solo, you're not on preset one boosted, you're actually on preset five. Ah, you can actually program what it does in that green mode. And so, you know, so the nice thing is it, 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 there's a little extra work, but the nice thing is that you, um, you can, you can basically have your, your solo sound be completely different than the, um, than the main sound. Nice. So I see it changing. You, wanna, you know, have the, uh, you know, the, the rhythm sound be, you know, the classic mode and the solo sound be the, uh, the smooth mode then um, you know you can do that and then so each one of those main four presets each one has its own solo preset that's kind of sits on top of it and you can uh, set them up separately that is very cool yeah and so it it's it, it, I, I can't tell you this is something we really need to uh, you know document and this is the first place we're telling people about it but i'll probably have to do it many more times yeah different than most pedals but i think it's a really useful feature and um you know just just uh I don't know, just made sense to do, even if it isn't the, the, the standard of how people do things. Right. So in essence, what you're saying is like, if you have a non MIDI rig, you're mm -hmm. not just getting four presets, you're actually getting eight. Correct. Yeah. So, so, and so that's why, um, you know, that's why we kind of had the separate solo button and then, you know, sort of the solo button was, you know, kind of its own button. So you can just switch quickly between, you know, sound A and sound B, and then you press both of them to move to, you know, the next pair of sounds. Gotcha. So you have faster access between like sort of a rhythm and a, and a lead sound with a single button press. Perfect. Yeah. So, yeah, we wanted to get it. We wanted to get people yeah, figured, you know, there's uh, six modes. So you probably want at least uh, eight sounds. And then um, if you if you are using MIDI, then you get access to uh, 100 different presets, which uh, is a lot of overdrive. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Yay. Well, I'm excited for you guys. Yeah. Well, we're excited that you like it. I, I was. No. Oh, it's fantastic. Sent, sent an email back saying how much you know it that yeah that it worked for you. And yeah, I think this is a game changer. I mean, when people really appreciate uh, the the um, the superiority of analog versus digital, and I mean, I know there's a lot of you know modeling and profiling and sampling and things that go on like that, but you know, basically they try they keep trying or working on it, I shouldn't say trying, but they're working on it more and more and more and more to get it to sound like analog. Yeah, so, they're, yeah. They're, they're getting closer, but it's still, you know, it's still, you know, there's still a, a, a <clears throat> gap there where, you know, only the analog stuff sounds analog, really, right. everything else is an approximation. And, and like I was telling you, most of, you know, most of the students that I see uh, around USC are still, you know, pedal guys. So uh, I think there's still, you know, a lot of folks that are, you know, like me who are diehard die hard pedal folks, so. Yeah, yeah, and it's even so, we've, you know, we've noticed, yeah, you know, we kind of went over the peak of, of, you know, rack gear and all that, and now, you know, there's, you know, more people are just, you know, just doing pedals. And, you know, the people who, you know, I think it really started with, with companies like uh, Strymon and Eventide, like coming out with, you know, really good quality pedals that are, you know, that were equal to or better than, you know, a lot of the rack gear. And so we kind of, you know, followed that trend with the PVCs and now this to say like, let's, you know, get really, you know, top shelf sound, you know, on a pedal board and, and, yeah. and also have all the cool MIDI stuff and the automation and all that. Yeah. Along or, you know, and, and even if a guy has, you know, like a Kemper or an Axe FX or like even the new um, neural uh, quad cortex, because those are MIDI, you know, this interfaces seamlessly with things like that. So, you know, if you want an analog drive, you know, you've got a real analog drive in the digital world, which is, you know, really, really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's all, you know, we always, always make sure that our stuff, uh, you know, plays nice with everything else. For sure. yeah. We play well with others. Play well with others, got to do it. <laughs> um, so I, we should probably wrap this up because I know you have to uh, get going, but do you have any 
any stories that you could tell us, you know, from these 35 or 40 years or whatever you've been in the studio, is there anything good that, that, uh, that you kind of find funny that you'd like to pass on? Funny. Well, uh, never underestimate the person for whom you are working. I'll never forget, uh, did a session a number of years ago and went to the studio and played on what I thought was the worst song in the world. And I said, oh boy, I really feel bad for this guy. This song is terrible, terrible. And it ended up being a number one R&B record and did very well on the pop charts. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. And also work is work. I played on, like I said, I played on Thriller, which a lot of folks heard. I also played on Disco Duck Part Two, which very few people heard. <laughs> so, uh, in, any work in the studio is good work. <laughs> is there anybody that you never got to play with that you wish you had? People like Wes Montgomery, you know. Uh, I fortunately got a chance to work with Ella Fitzgerald, which was very cool. Uh, but, you know, people like Wes Montgomery, work with George Benson, work with Earl Clue, work with, you know, Lee Rittenauer, folks, you know, great guitar players, uh, Stan Getz, um, uh, uh, oh gosh, can't think of his name. It'll come to me later. But a um, lot of great sax players. I worked with uh, Freddie Hubbard on a record for Freddie Hubbard. So I got to work with a lot of really amazing people, but I uh, never got to do anything with Wes. That would have been really cool. Oh, we so appreciate your time. And yeah. thank you for all your support. It really means a lot to us and all the time you put into this. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, much success with the pedal and, and uh, you know, keep me posted. All right, we will. Will do. <laughs>